Hello, welcome to the windiest day known to man. That thing right there is the KTM Super Adventure S. It's the Gen 3, so 2021 onward. I've owned it for two years and I've just hit 30,000 miles and I've been nagged by quite a few of you, rightly so, to do a two year ownership, 30,000 mile review. So we're here. It is windy as feck today and it's um, 30 odd degrees. So if I look sweaty, if I look disheveled, you can't hear anything because the wind's blowing. I can't tell whether I look really fat as well because I'm sort of slumped over. So in preparation for this video, I've done a bit of a, I've done a full spreadsheet with a breakdown of like my feelings on the bike, how it, how it handles on the road, how it handles off-road, the pros, the cons, cost of ownership. But I know that there's probably about 80, 90% of you sitting at home or on the toilet or wherever you are right now with one question on your lips and that is about reliability because it's a KTM and that seems to be the first question that anyone ever asks me. I went on three or four Facebook groups for the 2021 Plus model and I listed down pretty much every issue that someone has had that is actually an issue, whether it's been a warranty job or whether it's been an actual problem that KTM won't deal with or whatever. I have not included things that would have been solved if you went and got the bike now. If you're gonna buy it used, just make sure the recalls have been done. And then at the end of this video, I put this story on my Instagram and I asked all of you lot that follow me on Instagram if you had any questions about the bike in general. This might be quite a long video because there's a lot to go through. But if you want a 30 second breakdown and you're not gonna watch past this point, it's been brilliant. Absolutely adore the thing more than enough power, sounds great. It handles unbelievably well. I've just done a France trip with Joe, which you'll see in a few weeks time. And that sums up everything I could ever want to know about this bike. It started every single morning, no problem, as you'd expect. It sat on the motorway and we, I did 880 kilometers to get down to the south of France um, in one day and it did it faultlessly with radar crews on music and all sorts of stuff. I was relatively comfortable. Of course, I'm gonna have a bit of a numb ass, but you know. And then when we got there, dumped all of our stuff in the place that we were staying in, and it went and did the twisty B roads, those switchback mountain passes, and it did all of that like it was an oversized Super Duke. I got back and I was more in love with that thing than I was when I left. I've had no real issues with it. Servicing could be looked at as expensive, but we'll get onto that. I've had the recalls done, which were just the seat and some canister at the back. The only other thing that I got replaced that actually went wrong, the glass in the mirror, but essentially came away from the backing. So it rattled like hell and it was really annoying. KTM replaced under warranty. Would I recommend the bike? 1000%. I do it every time I speak to someone about it or someone asks me about it. So there is your sub minute roundup if you have the attention span of a three year old. And for those people that want more information, stick around. I'm gonna do the pros first because then it means more of you are gonna watch until I get to the negative, so I'll get a longer watch time. <laughs> As you'd expect with a 160 odd horsepower bike that has got very good suspension, has got very low down weight, this thing handles unbelievably well for an adventure bike. You drop it down into the corner, it's low weighted because of those low tanks, power out of that corner, it's on its back wheel. So as you'd expect around town, things like that, there's no problems with torque, pulling away from lights or anything like that. Sixth gear gentle roll on overtakes your in illegal figures very, very quickly. The only real thing with handling that I would like to be better is maybe a little bit more feel in the brakes. I've upgraded to sintered, double H sintered pads from ABC. You can get the Brembo road race pads, which are apparently really good as well. Never had a problem with stopping the bike, regardless of how fast I'm going. But you get on something like an 890 or whatever, and the brakes just feel a little bit more confidence inspiring. That's the one thing I'd probably upgrade. Off-road, if you haven't seen my ABR video from last year, I'll leave a link up in the corner somewhere. I stuck some TKC80s on it. I threw it around like an oversized dirt bike. I think I've got a picture somewhere where I'm, I'm a solid two or three foot off the floor on cast wheels, no issues at all. The suspension was fantastic. The slip control was fantastic and the wheels were fine considering they're cast wheels for now. So off-road handling, it's, it's way better. I mean, it's KTM. 
as you'd expect. I briefly touched on weight distribution there. Obviously the tanks are really low on this. So feet up U-turns, I've never known a bike so easy to do it on. The only thing that comes close is like a GS because they've got the, it's got the engine right down the bottom. I've never dropped it based on my balance. It's always been like, I've dropped it because I've rolled forward off the side stand or I've left a disc lock on. <laughs> Wind, weather and rain protection. The stock screen's a bit crap but I find it pretty much is on any bike you buy nowadays. So I've added the Puig clip-on screen or Puge. That's made a massive difference for me. Obviously I'm five foot nine. That's not gonna work if you're six foot four. There are aftermarket screens. I just think they look a little bit ugly, if I'm honest. Rain and general weather protection is actually really good. Like if I'm riding that in my road skin jeans, link in the description for 10% off. There's been times where I've ridden to work in my road skin jeans and my Halverson's jacket or whatever it's been and I've got home and my jeans have got a slight bit of water on but it's nothing substantial like riding in torrential rain your lower half is basically protected the only thing that's gonna get wet is my top half and then if it's really really torrential then I'll wear that lower Halverson stuff as well the stock mirrors on this do create quite a bit of turbulence I haven't swapped them yet they're not that bad but it's just you can tell there's a bit of turbulence off of them coming on to tech which this bike and various other new bikes are very well known for nowadays. I spec this with the tech pack and the heated grips. In the tech pack, you get things like suspension pro, the slip control. As standard, it comes with electronic suspension. It comes with the radar cruise control. It's got the motor slip regulation, corner and ABS, corner and traction control, and all that sort of stuff. As a general bike, even without the tech pack, it's very good. I still recommend going for the tech pack because it's a a lot of tech for the money. In that, I mentioned the Suspension Pro. Now, for me and us fellow shorties, that's a game changer for me. I'll put in a clip in a minute, but it essentially allows me to lower the rear of the bike so I can get my feet flat on the deck. So this is in its highest position. So you can see, I mean, I know I'm off-road, so it's slightly different, but I can get both feet down on both sides, going back down to zero. Watch my feet. So I can get both feet flat on the floor on 0%, which is brilliant. And again, I, I am off road, so it's slightly, bit, slightly different, but there's a slope away here. Just like that as an option is so useful. While I'm talking about tech, I genuinely think the user interface on that bike is one of the best on the market. I know BMWs look arguably better. I'm gonna do a test on this at some point actually and I'll, I'll bring it to you guys. It won't be in this video because I'm not in Cornwall. I reckon my mum, who is a, I won't say her, her age because she'll text me and tell me I'm a wanker or something, but she's not incredible with tech she's on her ipad and stuff like that so she's not completely alien to it but if i told her to go on my dad's bike and adjust the suspension settings i would have trouble finding that setting she would probably not be able to do it if i told her to do it on that i almost guarantee she could easily do it it is so user friendly it is clearly done it is easy to access there's animations to go with it so you know exactly what you're changing it's fantastic and i genuinely think it's one of the best on the market even on my m1000r video i struggled to find my range which sounds quite stupid if i'm honest but like i had to work out how to find the range on a twenty thousand pound bmw the other thing i find really good and one of the things that is better than some of the competitors in this same kind of category, Multistrada, is the range. As you would have seen in this video, that can do 285 miles on a tank quite easily, sitting at 70 on the motorway and still have 30 miles remaining, which is bloody good going for a 23 litre tank. You can get 150 miles from a tank, so, you know, you've got to be riding it conscious of what you're trying to achieve. For such a powerful bike and 23 litres i think that's brilliant as for radar cruise control uh you don't need it you can just switch between adaptive and normal cruise it does make a big difference on the long long journeys like when i go down to cornwall when i go up to scotland i do the same thing so yeah it's not a necessity but it is really nice to have i've also never had it break for me in the rain or any like poor conditions it's like i've ridden with 
with it on in torrential rain and it's still really good. Last thing for the pros, I guess, other than like, cause I can just go on about this bike for hours and I don't want to bore you all to death. The slip control. Now that is your wheelie control and your traction control tied together kind of thing. So if you have that on setting three or four, of nine nine being the most one being the least that will let you power wheelie to a quite a decent angle and it will still save the back end sliding out a bit too far yes it won't save you if you hit a load of gravel and throw a bike down the road and you've got it on one i like the option to have traction control on traction control dialable or traction control off whereas a lot of bikes will have off or on you get way too much help or none whereas i like to have just a little bit of help for when i run out of talent now, negatives, which you've all been waiting for. Now, these are my personal negatives. If you ride this bike like a GS or a Tiger, you will find it far too vibey. So if you are leaving it in fourth gear, doing 12 miles an hour, trying to power out of a corner, it is gonna shake your teeth out. I know a GS will do that, but a GS doesn't have 160 horsepower. Um, <laughs> and that's, how i ride a gs it's almost like a you can be lazy with it because the engine allows you to do it this one doesn't don't ride it lazily ride the bike use the gears use the throttle use the clutch like actually use it it will still pull in fourth gear but if you're in third it's just less vibey that's basically it you have to ride it like the bike it is like you would ride an s1000 xr like you'd ride a multi strider the other thing i found with the bike is the chain sensitivity is quite high if i just set this chain to ktm spec i get so much chain slap while i'm riding down the road it pisses me off quite frankly so i have always run my chain a little bit tighter to stop that chain slap the bike rides better for it in my opinion everything feels a bit tauter everything like the quick shifter feels smoother and all that kind of stuff i suppose the only negative for me if i was thinking about selling it would be the resale values Aprilia and a few others do the same thing, but you'll buy a KTM for essentially full price and then six months later they'll do what they're currently doing, which is a £2,000 trade-in offer. If you buy a bike for sixteen and a half grand, and then a week later they do a trading offer of two grand, your sixteen and a half grand can't be valued more than 13, 13 and a half, because it's going to be a 14 and a half for a brand new bike, so why would anyone buy a second-hand one? These seem to hold their value better as a private sale. Trading values are not great. Like I, with 30,000 miles, I dread to think what they'll offer me for this. The biggest absolute hatred of this bike is the people that buy them. And I know I'm telling that as a KTM owner. Let me explain. If you buy a GS or a Tiger, Multistrad or anything like that, and something goes wrong with it, you take it back to the dealer, your dealer fixes it under warranty, and you go, meh, never mind. It's a pain in the ass that something went wrong, but it went wrong. Not all of us, because I'm not one of them and there's quite a few out there that aren't them. But if something goes wrong, the first thing a KTM owner does is go on Facebook and bitches and moans about the quality of the bike, the how crap it is, how they're never gonna buy a KTM again, how they can't trust the brand, the dealers are shit. Oh, the list is endless and I don't understand it. On the European KTM 1290 2021 onwards owners group on Facebook, at least once a month, there is someone that posts up a post saying, let's make a list of things you don't like about your bike. I was just like, why are we discussing? Just enjoy the bike. If it's been that bad, get rid of it. Yes, the switch gear is not as nice as a BMW's or yes, okay, a Ducati Multistrada V4S at 28 grand feels more premium. Of course, why are we, like, you know what you're buying when you buy the bike, so why are you being like that? And that seems to be the general gist of most of the, old, the owners, like, KTM were crap 10 years ago. A lot has changed in the last five years, let alone the last 10 years. George has had issues with his Triumph. I hope you don't mind me saying this, Ollie, but Ollie's had two ECUs, two wiring looms, three or four brake switches on his Africa Twin. That bike's been rebuilt more than a lego set dave ashpole and his his group of mates that have all got gs's have all had new batteries they've all had a problem here or there the response when it's a bmw or a triumph is it happens when it's a ktm it's ktm i'm never gonna own one again and like there are ktm owners out there that will not fill their bike up with fuel and then when it conks out 
go on a forum and complain about KTM. Just stop it. Just stop it. <laughs> Please. It's really annoying. I'm going to do costs of ownership now because I've been ranting quite a lot about that KTM owner thing. So uh, yeah, let's do cost of ownership and then I'll go back to the actual problems that are in the market. So first thing, service cost. Service intervals on that are every 9,000 miles, which is really good. And the valve clearances are every other service. You've got an interim service at nine, valve clearance at 18. I think if you don't do enough mileage, the annual service is about 260 quid. My interim service, which is the 9,000 and the 27,000, my 27,000 just gone was 320 pounds. My valve clearance service with no shims cost me 782 pounds uh, at KTM in Hemel, which is the KTM center. I thought, well, what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna speak to some owners of other bikes and find out what their service costs are. So Dave Ashpole, thanks for this, and George, thanks for this. Joe has got a service plan on his Africa Twin, so he's, he doesn't count. <laughs> if you say you had 20,000 miles on your bike, Super Adventure would be two services, excluding the first service, the 600 mile service, we're just excluding that. That was free for me, just for argument's sake, but I know that varies, so I'm just gonna exclude the 600 mile service. One being 782 and one being 320, so you're around the 1100 pound mark. Dave Ashpole has got a GSA. They have a 6,000 mile service interval and the valve clearance is every other one as well. He paid 320 pounds for his interim services and 450-ish with the valve clearance one, which is obviously cheaper than KTM. The Superbench and his had the brake fluid change and all those sorts of bits, as well as the valve clearances. Obviously with the GS, you've got the valves right on the side, so it's quite easy to do. Difference is he would have had to have three services in that time rather than two at 450 quid for the valve clearance service and 700 quid for his two interim services. It's about the same. Now here's one that really shocked me. George, with his Tiger 900, has just had his valves done. His services are also every 6,000 miles and every other one being the valve clearance check. His interim service was 300-ish. His valve clearance cost him 901 pounds. 901 pounds. I mean, it is a triple, but yes, it's expensive. It's a big hit on the credit card or on the bank balance, but I don't think it's awful. Obviously that will depend where you are in the country. It can be way cheaper in some areas. It can be more expensive in others. Insurance. Now I'm 31 years old. Uh, I bought this when I was 29. I live in Hertfordshire, which is just north of London. So arguably one of the more expensive places to insure a bike. It's in a lock garage and I do about 12,000 miles a year. And I have all of my modifications declared. My first year's insurance, I had three years no claims. I was coming up from a 2017 Tracer 700 with 75 horsepower to a 1300cc brand new bike with 160 horsepower. That first year cost me £1,200 to insure it, which hurt. <laughs> the Tracer at that point was about £600 for the same thing. The second year's insurance, obviously I had an extra year's no claims, still commuting into London and all that sort of stuff. Second year's insurance was 850. I literally just renewed the insurance two days ago. All the same conditions, bar I've added a few modifications that you guys will see in next week's video, maybe the one after. I've declared those new modifications as well, and it came in at a total of 777 pounds. Paid in full for the year. Five years, no claims, I'm 31 years old, still commuting into London, shed load of modifications. It's not awful. That's with Bmoto, if anyone's interested. KTM are now offering a one year's UK and European breakdown cover for free if you get it serviced with them. If you go on RAC's website, that is this much. So take that off the cost of your service and it suddenly becomes way more competitive. We'll quickly talk about wear and tear and then I will talk about price versus the competitors because I know that's quite a big conversation i ride it relatively hard i'm on the brakes quite a bit commuting into work so i do go through them quite a lot and i replace my brake pads every 10,000 miles probably the most expensive thing to replace on this is the tires on average i'm getting about four to five thousand miles out of a rear tire i got the most amount of mileage out of a road six which was nearly six thousand miles anything like an anarchy adventure four thousand miles the tkc80s i got 13 or 1400 miles out of a rear. 
So it does eat tyres for breakfast. I've changed my tyres more this year than the entire time my dad has had his Tiger 900 and his Tiger 1200. You all know how I ride crap wheelies, jumps and off-road. And I haven't had my fork seals done. And they're not leaking. So, win-win. And chain and sprockets. I've had three chains on this now. My first one wasn't worn out, but um, when I got home from ABR last year, I found a, an O-ring hanging up bottom. I assume that's because I buried the bike. I swapped that to a DID chain with sprockets. They probably did 15,000 miles or something like that. Literally before I went to France, I changed the chain of sprockets again. I've got the power parts heavy duty rear sprocket so I bought that and I bought a chain of sprockets to go with it because I always want to change my chain with the sprockets so again I didn't really need doing for the sake of 200 quid and an hour and a bit of me in the garage I'd rather change it every 10,000 miles just because like it's then one less thing you have to worry about if you know what I mean let's talk money I paid almost on the dot 16,400 pound for that that was the bike the tech pack, the heated grips, the KTM power parts, crash bars and sump guard, and the KTM power parts headlight guard. I mean, that's pretty well specced bike for 16 and a half grand. Since then, I've added the power parts, ergo heated seats, the exhaust. I've changed out the crash bars to the Outback Motor Tech ones. I've got the Denali's with a hex easy can, carbon fiber chain guard, and various other little bits. Just stuff that I've bought. I'm going to get my phone out for this bit. I'm going to compare this bike to an R1250 GS, a Multistrada V4, and a Tiger 1200. Now, the reason I'm doing that is because they're all adventure bikes that you could take off-road. Bar the GS, they've all roughly got the same power. The base price on this is £16,599 in the UK. Uh, that is without the £2,000 trade-in offer, which if you don't know what that is, say you walked into KTM and they offered you nine grand for your bike, as a trading price, they would give you 11 grand for your bike with this 2,000 pound bonus thing they're doing at the moment. A base price GS is 14,990, so 1,500 quid less. A base price Multistrada V4 is 16,955, 400 quid more. Base price Tiger 1200 is 14,995, so five pound more than the GS. Now they're base specs. No one wants a base spec bike, let's be honest. Now personally, I would recommend not buying dealer branded products like if you're going to buy crash bars you can spend 300 quid on ktm lower crash bars or you can spend 500 quid on outback motor tech crash bars which are upper and lower and you know work if you haven't seen the crash video link up there <laughs> spending 450 pound for ktm fog lights 500 pound for bmw gs fog lights and all this sort of stuff when you can spend £100 less and get yourself some Denali's that have features. So you get my gist. But what I did, I went on the website now, I specced up my bike as I would want to walk out of the showroom with it from KTM, from BMW, from Triumph and from Ducati, specking everything I would want. So I'd want a radar if it's available, I'd want the heated grips, I want crash bars, I want the dick lights, I'd probably want a screen and I'd want the exhaust. You would never catch me spending £1,300 on an Akrapovich can from KTM, but I've done that for this video. None of these have luggage. Some people want luggage, some people don't. I don't have luggage. I've got a top box rack, but I don't use panniers or anything like that. This bike today would be £20,840. So a lot of money, but that's including an exhaust, it's including crash bars, it's including the sump guard, it's including the dick lights, all that kind of stuff. My spec 1250GS, it would be the TE because that's the spec that I'd want to sort of match the kind of electronic suspension and all that sort of stuff that this has. 21,685, 800 quid more, 900 quid more. My spec Tiger, it would be the Tiger Rally Pro is £20,826, £14 less than this would be. My spec Multistrada V4S, I'd like the Rally because that's the only one in their V4 range that will do more than 250 miles to a tank, but I'm not going to spend over 30 grand on a V4 Rally. Multistrada V4S, again no luggage, is £27,802, £7,000 more than that seven grand more than that you can buy a very good car for that 
Now, the only other thing I was going to discuss, which sort of, it was apparently a really controversial subject when KTM did this. I don't think there's a problem with it. And that is the demo mode. What this is on all new KTM bikes, and I assume other dealers will follow suit. When you buy one of these, every option, like electrical option on the bike, not heated grips or anything like that, tech pack and suspension pro and all, all that kind of stuff is on the bike for the first thousand kilometers or 600 miles which is your running in period pretty much there was so much anger in the in the community about this and i don't get it because it's like i get the premise of if it's on the bike i should just get it anyway they've paid to develop something so if you want to use it you have to pay for it that's that's how it that's how the world works unfortunately and the other side of that coin is i as i mentioned i paid for the full tech pack on this the full thing which was at the time it was a thousand and eighty five pounds or whatever i personally don't really care about the hill hole control and i don't really need the adaptive rear brake light the one that flashes at you when you're braking hard i knew within the first sort of two or three weeks that i wouldn't really use it the hill hole control can get annoying because it, because it actually only holds the bike for 15 seconds if i could have saved myself 200 pounds just knowing i wouldn't use them i wouldn't have bought them you can always add it on after if you wanted it but my the way i look at that is you buy a bog spec bike you get your running in period to work out which features you want and which ones you don't i personally think that's quite a good idea I don't know about you let me know in the comments let me know what you think but i personally would rather that because it could have saved me a couple of hundred quid now known issues in the market i'm going to rattle through some of these because i know it's really boring for a lot of people but these are ones that are mostly just on the facebook pages or on the forums first one on the list is you get a preload error if you rush the bike to turn it on you don't let it do its diagnostics and you turn it on every now and again you get a preload error all you have to do is turn the bike off leave it 10 seconds and turn it back on and it resets and it's fine wait until the side stand logo comes up and then start it and it's fine most of the errors i've come across are battery related so this comes down to essentially lack of riding to recharge the battery voltage that is used from starting the bike you need about 15 minutes of riding obviously the higher the revs are on the bike the more voltage comes out of your alternator 15 minutes of riding should have replenished your starting voltage all these new bikes with very high amount of electronics are very sensitive to low battery it throw a traction control warning or a preload error or whatever that happens on any of these bikes same thing with the xr same thing with the gs same thing with the tiger stick it on a battery maintainer if you're going to leave it more than like a week or so all of these new bikes are the same who makes the radars bosh who makes the imus bosh who makes the batteries probably uasa your battery in your gs or your tiger is probably exactly the same as the one in this like literally the same one so keep it charged essentially ride it more and when you do ride it don't just ride it to the shops ride it for half an hour an hour or whatever i think once these batteries deplete past like 12.8 volts most of them can't ever be recovered past that and back up to full health dave ashpole's had three batteries on his gsa because he doesn't get enough time to ride it and to be fair this is probably one of the reasons that i've had no problems with this because i ride it every week pretty much without fail i ride it two or three times into work and i ride it at the weekend mirrors i've already discussed told you my mirrors rattled one big one is that these bikes have two fuel taps a lot of ktm dealers for a while and some still do only turn on one of the taps because they're only used to a, a bike having one fuel tap so you'll find people will have 160 miles left in the tank and the bike will just conk out like it's got no fuel make sure both those taps are open and it's fine it's saved quite a few people very occasionally they come out of the factory with a not very tight coolant pipe on the coolant reservoir so occasionally you get a coolant leak you just need to go in and tighten up that bolt these are things that should be picked up by the tech uh, working on or prepping your bike Th things get missed with human so you know annoying but you know whatever sometimes at high speed there is a bit of a handlebar wobble that can be attributed to the stock tires that can be a loose headstock like headstock bearing get get your dealer to tighten it up if you're still having problems and those two things have done try lowering the forks five mil in the triple clamps that help bring the weight over the front and bump the rear preload up 
for the most part it's just a light front end so like a not enough weight over the front end people moaning about this are saying it does it at like 240 kilometers an hour which is what 130 140 mile an hour i know a lot of us don't like will occasionally hit triple digits and it's solid if you're riding a bike at 220 kilometers an hour everywhere what are you doing like Next one is the, sometimes you get a key out of range thing. This is not a, a KTM specific thing. This happens with any keyless bike. Um, I found most people that are saying they have it, they have it in their jacket pocket and it's a certain type of like laminated Gore-Tex jacket. It seems to block the signal for the bike. Take the key out of the pocket, I guarantee it turns on. Like sometimes there's some paint imperfections. A guy called Josh, I know he had paint peeling off his swing arm. I know a couple of people that have got the brake fluid reservoir paint peeling off. There's going to be a Friday afternoon bike every now and again. I had a conversation with Josh about his because KTM wouldn't cover it. And the problem is, and I kind of get KTM's point on this, is that he bought the bike second hand. They don't know what he or the previous owner has used to clean the chain. If the previous owner, for example, had used like a really abrasive acetone kind of chemical to clean his chain and that's eaten through the paint until it's a problem that lots of people have then it's not a warranty thing unfortunately i mean sort of the same boat with is there's a few people that have sort of slipping clutch problems like i know moz you're one of them and ktm won't replace the clutch for you under warranty because it's a wear and tear part as much as i know you can ride and your dealer probably knows you can ride there are complete morons out there that will just sit on the clutch and burn through the clutch plates. And so them sitting there going until this is a proper KTM known problem, they won't do it. Luckily, I mean, it's only 350 quid with labor to replace, so it's not the end of the world, but there's so many contributing factors. Like, do the clutch plates dry out if you don't use the bike enough and then they wear away quicker because they're dry? I, like, I don't know. If you've got a GS, if you've got a, a tiger or anything like that i don't think it'd be much different the difference is with a bmw or a triumph they butter it up quite a lot more your clutch has been worn but we can't guarantee it's a, a proven thing so it's not going to be covered under your warranty but what we'll do is we'll do this and we'll do that and we'll make make you feel a little bit more loved and ktm ktm dealers are not as copy paste they're not as premium and, and not as like they're a little bit more rough and ready for me, with like your situation, Moz, I'd love it if KTM went, yeah, we, we don't agree that KTM UK have made the right decision here. We can understand what they're doing, but if you pay for the parts, we'll pay for the labour or vice versa. And it's like a bit of a, yeah, I mean, I feel like I'm being stitched up, but at least I'm not being screwed over. Again, not a massive market problem, but worth knowing about. Part availability, I'm not even gonna to touch on that because it's everywhere. Side stand bolts sometimes come loose. It happened on mine. I don't know why it did it, but I just took them out, locked tight, put them back in, it hasn't happened since. Certain components will go, like fuel pump or crank position sensor or whatever. Like they're all gonna be Bosch components or they're all gonna be whatever components. So it's not gonna be any different if you get a GS or a Tiger or whatever. So I'm not gonna really dwindle on those too much because I just think it's a like, Again, if the IMU went in this, it's a Bosch unit. So that can be any, any bike that has that unit in that goes, it's not just KTM. The only other one that happened with this that I can find that was actually worth talking about, because the brake light switch is on the suspension, sometimes it rubbed, wore through and then shorted out on the bike. So you'd get like a warning and like you get a load of warnings that come up on the bike. That was a design fault, pretty much. I think most of the new bikes have had it sorted. I haven't had that problem, but I know it's in the marketplace. I think that's most of the actual market problems. Most of them get replaced under warranty. Most of them are very few and far between, but they're ones that I found on Facebook. So there's a list of all the ones that I can find. So the only thing left is to go through your questions. I put this on my Instagram story and I had a load of questions come through from a load of you lot. I'm going to rattle through these as well because I'm well aware I've been talking to the camera for like an hour. The first one, which is quite important, does the glove box meaning the little flap at the front of the bike, does it fit a Kit Kat peanut butter? As you can see, it easily fits that. It fits my phone, which is a Samsung S21, I think it is. It won't fit a lot of the big, big phones, like if you've got a, a Note or a Pixel Plus or a, an iPhone Pro with the 72-inch screen, it won't fit that in. 
one from Mr. Ollie Ray. Anything that you would want the bike to have that others have. The Android Auto slash Apple CarPlay on screen, where you can have your Google Maps up on screen. Saves you having to spend 350 quid on a Garmin. Would love it if the hill hole control stayed on. One other thing I'd want the bike to have, um, which is a bit controversial for a KTM because I know they're very off-road focused, shaft drive. I understand on the more off-road focused bikes like your 790 Adventures and your 890 Adventures and your Enduro bikes, yeah, chain. For a street model big bore adventure bike, I don't think it's necessary to have a chain. Maybe the R should have the chain and the S could get a shaft. Um, love a good shaft. I don't think the bike's missing anything else, but that just would be a nice thing. If you had to replace it today, what would I buy? Another one of these, 2023 one. If I had to buy a bike today that wasn't a super adventure, if I had the money, it would be a V4S Multistrada. The thing that's lacking in that is the, the range. Even with rear cylinder deactivation, it'd barely do 200 miles if you're lucky. If I didn't have the money, which is quite often the case, I'd probably buy myself a Norden 901 Expedition. Um, I quite like those. And they're essentially an 890, which also would be the other bike I'd buy, an 890R. Uh, did buying it make your penis any bigger? No, unfortunately not. But it's really good for compensating because it's got a load of power and it's noisy and stuff and it's bright orange. What's the engine heat like? Um, it is still warm. Like I said, today was 30 odd degrees. The engine got to around like the low 90s for oil temperature and water temperature was like high 80s, early 90s as well. It is a warm bike because it's a 1300cc, but the twin radiators make a massive difference. So like there's very, very rarely a time when I'm sitting on it going, oh, this is hot. It also blows the heat away from your legs, which is nice as well. Does it give you a fizzy sensation behind your penis? Yeah. Yeah, it does. Any issues with peg ground clearance in corners? No. I haven't grounded those pegs out at all. They are the SW Motec ones, but they're actually wider than the stock ones. I've been, like I mentioned earlier, I've been on the side of the Continental Trail attacks. I could probably get my knee down if I actually tried, but the pegs don't seem to come anywhere near the floor. And if anything, I would have thought the center stand would probably hit the floor before the pegs. Sorry, my GoPro just died because it's too hot. Who would have thought that GoPros don't like temperature changes? Closest competitor for getting the GS and why did I go for a Super Adventure S? Multistrada, maybe? Same kind of power, same kind of cock kind of factor. You can ride it fast, it's very good. Uh, you'd have to go to a rally to get the fuel range, I guess. And you definitely have to go for the S so you can get the radar. Obviously they're more premium, quite clearly, but they're also seven grand more expensive. If it was just a road bike, I would lean towards maybe like an XR, but yeah, a, a meaty kind of twin slash V4, would, I, I would go, I would personally go for the Multi. Um, why did I choose the Super Adventure S over that, the Multistrada? Price being the big one. The phone port on the Multistrada S doesn't fit this which is a very average size phone. Cost of service, Ducati have got, obviously got rid of their Desmo engines, which is great, which means the valve clearances are every 30,000 miles or whatever it is. But your average annual service, people, like there's reports of people paying like seven or 800 quid for their average annual service, which is ludicrous. The fuel range was a big thing for me as well. I like to do trips. I like to go away. And obviously, if you've got a bike that will only do 160, 170 miles on a tank, even with rear cylinder deactivation, I can't do that. I can't be in the middle of the Scottish Highlands and only have a 150 mile tank, especially if you're riding quick. It's one less thing to worry about. Worth noting as well, my dad has had a Multistrada V2 one of the original V2s. He had loads of problems with that with the dealer. Again, like a lot of these problems are dealer related. If you've got a good dealer, it doesn't matter. Uh, his Multistrada from factory, the rear brake didn't work. Ducati couldn't fix it for some reason. It, like, it just went to the floor. Ducati couldn't fix it. And when he spoke to the main, like the head tech at the Ducati dealer, he said, you just don't need a rear brake anyway. No one uses a rear brake. You're like, what? I mean, if, if anything else, it's an, it's an MOT failure. Dave Ashpole, when are you swapping for a GS? 
Sorry, I nearly fell asleep reading that question. I will consider buying a GS when it has got over 160 horsepower because it weighs a lot, so it needs that kind of money, that kind of power. When it's got a bit more of a knob factor to it, if they bring an M1300 GS out with 200 horsepower, yeah, crack on, mate. I'd love one. But on one condition, when the Polite Vest Brigade, the people that think they're better than you, when those guys hate them because they think they're unnecessary, that's when I'll buy a GS. There you go. Deal. Shake on it. <laughs> that's such a knobby reply. <laughs> and also, I can't buy one because I've mugged Bruce, Dave, Mark, quite a lot. I've, I've mugged quite a lot of people off for having a GS, being old men and... <laughs> Would I go big bore again? i.e. big big engine, would you think middleweight is okay? 100% middleweight's fine. There's genuinely a part of me that thinks maybe, a, a, for, the, for the stuff I do, maybe an 890 Adventure, like the new one, would be better than that. I kind of like having the, the stupid power. Anything, if you're doing off-road especially, those are brilliant. If you're slightly older and you want a lighter weight bike, brilliant. Or if you just want a lighter weight bike anyway, brilliant. Or obviously buying something this big costs more, costs more to service, costs more to maintain. Any weird niggles? Oh, like the, the phone port thing. If you've got your steering lock on, you can't open that. It does hit the handlebars. There may be an element of safety to the fact that it won't open fully. You can't get your phone out if the handlebar lock is on. You can't open it enough. So I'd trust it more leaving my phone in there with the, hand, the steering lock on than I would if it opened fully. Like I would never leave my phone in there. Some people find it annoying, but I'm like, well, just straighten the handlebar. To fill up the coolant, you have to take the side panel off, which is slightly annoying. He literally says in this question, like, anything that's not really problems, just weird niggles. So yeah, really clutching at straws. I don't think that, I don't think there's any other like weird little niggles, like not, nothing that I've dealt with anyway. Last one that isn't penis related. Is it worth buying the tech pack? Yeah, 100%. I think more than anything, it's probably worth it in the resale value alone. If you bought my bike and I, I spec'd it as having the tech pack, everyone knows that that's a, that means it's got everything on it. It's like buying a GS that's a TE. Everyone knows that that's got everything on it. So that's the one you want. But the value for money and the amount of stuff you're getting, it's worth it, in my opinion. So that is pros and cons, handling, general performance, balance and weight, things that bug me slash niggles, anything and everything that might be an issue that I can find in the market. If I haven't found one or you've got more problems, stick it in the comments. Service cost, service intervals, insurance cost, cost versus the competitor, including the base and the spec'd up versions of how I'd have it, what I would have slash what I'd want to change on it if I could, what I'd buy if I had to replace it, and would I buy it again. Pretty comprehensive. The longest video I've probably done on my channel, but 30,000 mile review, not bad going, right? So that's it. That is my 30,000 mile two year review on my KTM Super Adventure S. Have you got any questions? Have, you got, have I not covered something? Have I missed anything? Please let me know in the comment section below. If you've got to the end of the video, bloody well done. And if you've got to the end of the video, I'll let you know a secret. That is the last time, literally from tomorrow, that is the last time that bike's looking like that because I've got some toys coming for it. I will be revealing the bike at the ABR festival. If you're going to be at the ABR festival, I'm gonna do it on the Thursday afternoon slash Thursday evening. So if you're going to be there, I'll let you know where I'm gonna be. I'll put my location on Instagram. I'm gonna get back on the bike. It's been sitting there for an hour and a half, two hours, so probably won't start now, fucking KTM. <laughs> Thanks again for watching this horrendously long video. I hope I've answered all of your questions, and I will see you in next week's video, which is going to be the first one of that looking slightly different. Bye.